With the development of information technologies over the last few decades, fakes have been a very serious and much discussed issue. There's the really serious issues of fake news and deep fakes, which is where you take a video or a photo of someone and you make it appear as though they're doing or saying something that they didn't actually do. But much simpler is making an unaltered copy of something. For a long time, there's been the issue of software, music, and television being copied and distributed to people who didn't pay for it. And then there's small time content creators who understandably want credit for their work, having it stolen and used without giving them any money or credit. A file can be very easily copied, but with enough effort and skill, actually anything can be copied. This painting behind me, well, I just made this with some leftover paint by making a streak and letting it randomly drip, and personally I couldn't reproduce it if I tried. But a skilled artist, maybe helped out by uh, some kind of computer, could, in theory, take precise enough measurements and make an exact reproduction that would be indistinguishable from this original. However, quantum information cannot be copied. This is a fundamental principle called the no-cloning theorem. Unlike the case with classical systems, there can never exist a physical process that takes an arbitrary quantum state and produces two copies. This was the inspiration behind the first proposed application of quantum information to cryptography, quantum money. If I have a coin or a bill, it's always possible, given enough effort, to make a copy. But using quantum states, it could be possible, theoretically, to make money that cannot be copied. The task is then to use quantum states in a way that they still can't be copied, but they have enough structure that their authenticity can be verified. And there are several proposals for how to do this. We could ask for something even more. Instead of having uncopyable tokens whose authenticity can be verified, we could ask for uncopyable tokens from which an authorized user can extract a message. This is called unclonable encryption, and there are recent proposals for how to do this using quantum states as well. Finally, we could ask for something even stronger. We could try to make uncopyable tokens that allow anyone to evaluate a certain functionality, but this ability could not be copied, so only a single user at a time would be able to evaluate the functionality. This is called software copy protection, and this is what I'm going to focus on. Before I talk about what we know about quantum software protection, I want to emphasize that this is really a far future application. Maybe at CWI's 150th anniversary, some of my academic descendants will be talking about how they've managed to actually implement this. One reason is that if you buy copy protected software that is a quantum state, you'll probably want to store that in memory when you'll need a quantum memory. Right now, it's a challenge to keep a quantum memory free of errors even for the duration of a short computation. But if you buy a copy protected software, you're likely going to want to store it in memory for more like weeks, months, or even years. We will likely not be able to implement something like this until well after we have working quantum computers. But on the bright side, that means we have lots of time to come up with a theory about how to copy protect software using quantum states. And that's good news because this is a really difficult problem. However, we have made some baby steps so far and that's what I'm going to explain. First, we're going to restrict our attention to a very restricted set of functions called point functions. A point function is a function that maps n bit strings to 0 and 1, and specifically, it maps one string to 1 and all other strings to 0. For any n bit string p, we call the point function that maps p to 1 and everything else to 0 f sub p. Why would we want to copy protect software that implements point functions? Well, there are some applications. For example, checking a password is a point function. However, to be completely honest, one of the reasons that we study point functions is because there are rather simple class of functions, and this problem is hard. We hope that if we can develop copy protection for point functions, we can use the same ideas and techniques to develop copy protection for more general classes of functions. A copy protection scheme is a way to encode a program, like one that evaluates a point function, into a quantum state so that it can't be copied. We'll get to that can't be copied part in a second, but first, what does it mean that a program is encoded in a quantum state? What it means is that we can take a program that encodes a point function f sub p, together with an input x to the function f sub p, and we can run them on a quantum computer, and we'll get out the answer. And we'll allow this process to be wrong with some very small probability. At least, this is what we would like to achieve, but we can also consider a weaker notion of correctness, 
where we only require the answer to be correct with high probability over the input. So if we imagine that the input to our function is the point P with probability 1 half, meaning that the correct answer will be 1, and otherwise it's a uniform input that's not equal to P, in which case the answer should be 0, then we require that the answer we get from evaluating our program is correct with high probability over this distribution on inputs. This is not exactly the notion of correctness that we would like to have ultimately, but it's a compromise that we're going to make for now. When we talk about software copy protection, we mean we want to encode a program so it's protected against a malicious user, the pirate, who wants to take our original program and make two copies. So what does it mean for the pirate to have two copies of the program? Well, it means that he can output two quantum states and send one to Alice and one to another user, Bob, such that both of them can run the program to evaluate the point function. So if the pirate succeeds, then we should be able to play the following game with the pirate and the two users, Alice and Bob. We'll generate two inputs and send them to each of Alice and Bob and ask them to evaluate the point function and send back their answers. If the pirate was successful in copying the program, then both Alice and Bob should be able to evaluate the function and win this kind of game. So we'll say that the program is copy protected if that's not possible. More specifically, when we give them their inputs, we'll give them with probability one half the point P to evaluate so that their answer should be one, and otherwise we'll give them a uniform input that's not equal to P so that their answer should be zero. Because if we just gave them a uniform random input, then most of the time the answer would be zero and it would be very easy for them to win almost all the time by just always outputting zero. Then we'll say that the program is copy protected if they can't win this game with probability significantly more than one half, which is what they could do by just randomly guessing the output. One thing I haven't specified is whether or not the users, Alice and Bob, are honest. The pirate is obviously dishonest. He's trying to copy software. But with Alice and Bob, it's not so clear. They could be freeloaders trying to steal pirated software, but they could also be honest users who just don't realize they've bought software that's not legitimate. And this leads to two very different scenarios. In one, which we call the honest user scenario, Alice and Bob are honest, which means that they think they have the actual legitimate program. They're going to try to run it like it's the real program, and they will not accept special instructions from the pirate telling them to run some sort of crack program to trick the copied software into thinking they have a license or anything like that. They're not going to be willing to run it using some kind of shady emulator. They're going to run it just exactly as if they have the manufacturer's instructions. So the pirate has a really challenging task. He has to copy the software in a way that allows the users to both run it, while also fooling them into thinking they have the real thing. It's easier to design a copy protection scheme in this setting because a pirate's task is necessarily harder. At least in comparison with the other setting, which we call the malicious user setting, in which the users are willing to cheat to run the pirated software. Then the pirate just has to turn his one program into two programs that might look quite different from the original, but can nonetheless both be made to evaluate the function. These two scenarios naturally have an intermediate scenario, the honest malicious scenario, in which one user is honest and one user is malicious. In that case, the pirate's task is to extract a copy of the program from the original while keeping the original program intact to send to the honest user. It might seem oddly specific to consider a scenario in which one user is honest and one user is malicious, but it turns out this scenario is actually related to a very reasonable setting called secure software leasing. In secure software leasing, the pirate has borrowed software and must return it. What we want to prevent him from doing is keeping a copy for himself while also convincing the owner of the software that he has returned it. This is similar to the honest malicious setting if we let the owner be one of the users and the pirate be the other. Then the software the pirate starts with is like what he gets from the owner. The copy he gives the honest user is like the copy he returns to the owner and the copy he gives the malicious user is like the copy he keeps for himself. In fact, we show that copy-protected point function software in the honest malicious setting implies secure software leasing for point functions. The other way around does not hold. Our recent result is to show how to use quantum states 
to copy protect point functions so that they can be run with average correctness and can't be copied in the honest malicious model, meaning it's not possible to take a real program and turn it into one copy that looks like the real thing and a second shady looking copy that can also be used to evaluate the function. While there is some work on copy protecting point functions in the malicious user model and on secure software leasing, where there's a stronger definition of correctness, these prior works required some assumptions like random oracles or computational assumptions. Our results, while they only satisfy a weaker definition of average correctness, they are the first unconditional results in this direction. The way we construct our protocol is using something called total quantum authentication. Roughly speaking, a quantum authentication scheme is a way of encoding a message so that if an adversary intercepts the encoded message and tries to alter it, for example, the message might be a video and the adversary is trying to make a deep fake, then either whatever the adversary does will have no effect on the message or the adversary's attempts at tampering will be detected. There has been lots of work on trying to make quantum authentication schemes in the last few years using various different definitions of what it means to be a quantum authentication scheme. We use a type of authentication scheme called the total authentication scheme, and we show that it can be used to construct a copy protection scheme for point functions that is secure in the honest malicious scenario and has average correctness. Total authentication has the property that if an encoded message is accepted by Bob, whatever the adversary did, it's as if he did it without interacting with the encoded message at all. That means that, for example, if the adversary attempts to make a copy of the message, either Bob will reject the message he receives, or the adversary's attempted copy will have nothing to do with the actual encoded message. So if we think of Bob as the honest user, he can evaluate the point function by authenticating. And if he accepts, then whatever else the adversary outputs, it can't be any use in evaluating the point function because it has nothing to do with the encoded program. Ultimately, what we show is that quantum total authentication can be used to implement point function copy protection that is secure in the honest malicious model with average correctness. And that this in turn implies secure software leasing of point functions. And since there are a number of ways to implement total authentication, we can actually achieve both of these things. There's clearly room for improvement here, even if we continue to restrict our attention to point functions. It would be nice to achieve a more standard notion of correctness instead of just being correct on average over inputs. And it would also be nice if we could achieve copy protection in the stronger malicious user setting. It turns out that both of these things are related. We show that if you could come up with a copy protection scheme for point functions, that has average correctness, but is secure in the malicious user setting, then you could turn this into a scheme that has the full version of correctness and is still secure in the stronger malicious user setting. So although we don't yet know how to do this, this gives hope that there is some path for coming up with a copy protection scheme for point functions in the future that satisfies the full correctness as well as the full stronger security of the malicious user setting.